and tales for dark nights. Want to make sure you never miss a Chilling Tales for Dark Nights video again? Be sure to subscribe and hit that bell to turn on notifications. Welcome back, friend, and a happy Veterans Day to all our veterans out there. There's no armistice that costs a day blood, though. The fight goes on. It's us versus them. The Druby Brothers in one corner, Polite Society in the other. Oh, I'm just flapping my gums, Chester. You run out of things to say after a while. Uh, come on in, friend. Hmm. Oh, that's better. So, tonight we welcome back our old pal, Mario E. Martinez. And things are about to get weird. So, smoke them if you've got them and drink those glasses to the bottom, y'all. Cause old Drew Blood has a tale to tell. And by first, rig him a roll, motherfucker. Uh, you're listening to the standard edition of this program. If you'd like to show your support and enjoy ad-free versions of this and all our other episodes, visit simplyscarypodcast.com and click Patrons in the upper menu. Sign up today. You'll get instant access to the whole enchilada, including hundreds of tales from our audio archives dating all the way back to 2012. Thank you for your support. Got a story or two you'd like to hear on the show? Send it to drewbloodhorror at gmail.com. If selected, we'll do business. For our story tonight, we're joining Thomas on his brand new job. Turns out the boss's kid is a bit of a handful. So, without further delay, I give you, from author Mario E. Martinez, Leonard and the Carousel. The company assigned him to the Riverside Mall, and at first the idea excited Thomas. He hadn't been to that mall since he was a kid. The storefronts, bright and filled with delights, lit up his memories. The mall's layout nearly unfolded itself in his mind, from the Silver Coin Arcade and the Sal's Pizza to Canale's department store that hid behind the two-story carousel and its obnoxiously cheery music. Thomas could still hum the tune with ease. Once he remembered, he and his grandmother tried to catch the last feature of some cartoon at the movie theater, but they never made it. Instead, they walked the entire length of the mall in defeat, his grandmother breaking the silence with apologies, but Thomas hadn't said anything because he'd needed no apology. The empty mall was better than any movie. The main corridor, with its high ceilings and avant-garde sculptures of doves floating among spheres of tin, was for them alone. The storefronts were dark, obscured by their gates and hid their inventories in shadow. Even the carousel was off. The horses, their white teeth and tails touched dulled, were lifeless without the multicolored lights and happy song. Thomas had imagined breaking away from his grandmother and running, running with all his speed through the empty mall. He enjoyed those images as he exited the highway to downtown Puentes. But what greeted him was not the same joyous building of his memories. Riverside Mall now looked like a blockish beast drudged up out of the river that lazily moved behind it. The sign was rusted, some of the bulbs blackened by neglect. The parking lot was more pothole than asphalt, and within the ruts were nests of cigarette butts and the occasional syringe. The service entrance Thomas was used to was beside the main doors. Its glass was marred by carved names and gang signs. Thomas found the door locked and rang the bell inside. The day man, Reuben, took a minute before he inched his way to the door and looked out its steel mesh window. He recognized Thomas by his photocopied ID from the company and unlocked the door. 
The service corridor they walked was drab, the smell of cardboard and cheap disinfectant hanging inside it. The narrow hall was dotted by steel doors for the shops to get their deliveries. The security room was tucked away in its center. Even before entering the little room walled with monitors, Thomas was uneasy. The isolation, the decay he thought, in the right context were frightening and strange. The dark had that power he knew. So did the lonely hours he'd work. Yet what tied all the strangeness together was the old woman waiting for him and Reuben. Mrs. Maria V. Crawford owned them all. She was a plump woman, short in stature, but gave off no air of frailty. Her black eyes were deep, their stare weighty. When she spoke, her voice was surprisingly buoyant and youthful. You were informed of the standard duties, yes? She asked. Not really, Thomas said. The agency told you nothing? No, he told her. They just gave me the assignment and told me to show up. That is unfortunate, she said. Have you done this work long, Mr. Players? It'll be one night when I clock out tomorrow, Thomas joked. So, Mr. Players, what exactly is your experience? Truth be told, this is my first week out of training, Thomas admitted. I had some career changes. This too seemed to vex Mrs. Crawford. She lifted her hand to silence him. No matter, she said finally. This job does not require much skill. For an hour, you will sit in this room and watch these monitors. If anything odd occurs, call the authorities. If nothing... Once that hour is up, you will walk the building. If again you see nothing, return and repeat the process. Have you had a lot of break-ins? No, she answered, offering no more explanation than that. As you no doubt noticed, this place is past its prime. More than likely, any thief would target the pawn shop down the road. No, I'm more interested in not incurring additional costs. Other than your employment, of course. Yeah, with this economy, Thomas started to say. The economy has little to do with it, Crawford corrected. Simply put, the city has grown outward and the area is no longer fashionable. Now, even the lowliest of anchor stores wants nothing to do with the mall that's on the outs, to borrow a creditor's phrase. One day, I suppose, if I were so inclined... I could sell the land and get a hefty profit. But that brings me to the most important part of our meeting. My son, Leonard, Mrs. Crawford said. The way she spoke his name seemed to drive the air from the room. Does he work here too? Thomas asked. The question made the silent Reuben fidget. Mrs. Crawford glared at him. My son is unable to work. So much of what was canon in my youth is now barbarity and madness. There were complications with Leonard, a prenatal supplement, metathormiacin, it was called. That's what made him different. You see, my son is unique, shy. He was born healthy, strong. But his mind never truly developed. Thomas smoothed his hair. I'm sorry to hear that. Reuben groaned. Apologies are for tragedies, Mr. Players. She shot back. My son is a miracle. A misunderstood miracle. She continued. Children with his condition usually die in the womb. But not my Leonard. Not my sweet, curious boy. It was people, with their ignorance and mockery, that drove him into this state and forced my hand. Leonard tried the world and was left wanting. So I opted for this new arrangement instead. See, he always loved this place, so I let him wander around at night when no one is here. He likes to look into the shops, play in the arcade 
and even ride the carousel. The boy can work it by himself. Okay, I'll introduce myself and... You most certainly will not meet my son, Mrs. Crawford said. Uh, people looking at him, that triggers the old feelings. People made him uncomfortable and still do. I've informed him that you will be here during his playtime and to ignore you. So if you hear the carousel or see the arcade gate open, it is Leonard, and thus no cause for alarm. But I cannot stress it enough. Don't speak to him. Don't gesture to him. And above all, do not look at him. Did the last guy do that? My lawyers have informed me to say nothing of Mr. Arredondo's accident, Crawford said, struggling to rise. Carlos moved to help her, but one stare sent him back to the wall. Standing finally, Mrs. Crawford told him, In spite of all I've told you, this should prove to be a very mundane job. One hour here, one hour of rounds. Repeat until Reuben opens in the morning. Yes, ma'am. Good, she said, waddling to the door. If there is an incident with a thief, you can explain it to a police officer, she said. Leonard, on the other hand, if he were to catch someone... The bathroom is next to the food court and all the vending machines work. I didn't bring any change, Thomas said, patting his clothes. Mrs. Crawford grinned almost imperceptibly. That's a pity, she said and left. Reuben opened the door for her and hurried down the corridor to open the rest. Thomas stood in the guard station and tried to adjust to the vast and empty solitude. The walls of monitors served as a reminder that Riverside Mall was once the third longest in Texas. One screen showed the carousel at an odd angle, and Thomas remembered that he wasn't alone. In that giant building, it was just him and Leonard. Thomas dreaded that first night. The thought of making the rounds in the dark with a socially inept recluse tensed his shoulders and tightened his jaw. The monitors didn't help. Their lack of color and sound mixed with the shadows of the storefronts and kiosks made everything look sinister, and all of their angles were off-center. Thomas thought it was a way of letting Leonard move around without being seen. That realization made his anticipation worse. At the top of the hour, Thomas took a series of deep breaths and walked into the main corridor of Riverside Mall. It was a shock to see the state of a cherished childhood memory. What was left were the scraps of commerce. The benches were square slabs of reclaimed planks painted a sticky blue, and the rectangular pots for mid-mall plants were filled with cancerous fiddle leaf and cigarette butts mixed with the stale dirt. Some of the gated storefronts Thomas realized had been closed long before he ever got there, their innards vacant except for the shells of countertops and the bones of display racks. Empty places with signs from a dying era copies of a copy of a copy, until there was nothing left but their distorted remains. One such place was J&B Toys. Its sign was a smiling train, and from its smokestack puffed the store's name in a font popular 20 years ago. From what he saw, the toys, teddy bears left to die in piles, and a wall of discolored heroes with misspelled names, were either entirely generic or plain knockoffs. Thomas used his flashlight to see a stack of off-putting baby dolls in the back of the store. Even from that distance, Thomas felt the itch of their cheap fabric. Another, which replaced the long-gone Zoinks, was a sporting goods store where for all the time Thomas stared into it, he couldn't find the brand name on any of the equipment. It depressed him to see Riverside in such a state. 
His boots scrunched on the broken tiles, and he dodged more than one construction area. Open holes in the floor taped off with cheap plastic ribbons and anchored by trash cans. But as he neared the eastern wing, a faded sign brought a smile to his face. The Silver Coin Arcade. All the old memories of pumping quarters into the Kothdar the Barbarian cabinet or firing off round after round in Classroom of the Dead, these made him nearly run to it. Though Thomas knew what kind of place the Riverside Mall was now, he hoped somehow, by some miracle, the arcade had been spared by time. The smell of its carpets and walls dashed his hopes away. A stale stink of mold and cigarette smoke left to moisten in the humid air wafted through the lowered cage door. Some of the games were still inside, the few remaining game cabinets discolored and chipped, but they had been replaced mostly with slot machines and video poker. Thomas lingered, hoping to glimpse any game of his youth, but was disappointed again. He turned away, and knowing no one would care, lit a cigarette. The smoke couldn't make Riverside Mall any worse with its coin-operated rocket ships half-destroyed and its lone restaurant, pizza and beer, stinking of congealed grease and farts. He didn't see or hear Leonard that first night. Riverside seemingly only vague shadows as though wanting Thomas to mourn what had once been. Still, he kept his mind sharp, ready to stop at any strange echo or whispered word. Yet, it wasn't until the fourth night that Thomas had any real evidence that Leonard really existed. On the sixth hour of his shift, Thomas stood at the front window of Babette's, which, from the merchandise, catered to the slutty but economical grandmothers of the area. After lighting a cigarette, he noticed one of the potted plants had been dug up. The soil and cigarette butts were scattered on the floor, and they'd been arranged in an almost childlike way. Simple shapes, the sun and moon. Further down the main corridor, dirty handprints smeared the walls and smudged the display window of a jewelry store. Their cubic zirconia and glass pieces glistened like distant stars. Further still, one of the store's gates had been lifted enough for someone to squeeze through. In the heavy silence, hangers clacked on their racks and heavy feet slapped on the tile in the dark. Something in the dark laughed, throaty and buffoonish. Thomas froze. It wasn't the jubilant laughter of a thief collecting loot, but of a child overjoyed to have found some shiny bauble that might entertain them. Yet there was a raw power to the sound a strength in its childish unpredictability. <laughs> Careful not to make noise himself, Thomas backed away slow. As Mrs. Crawford had told him, all he had to do was make the rounds and leave Leonard alone. If it was a thief, he'd find out about it the next pass. If Crawford got mad, he'd say all he did was follow her instructions. Back in the surveillance room, Thomas watched the monitors diligently. Even the hint of movement sent him face to face with one of the greasy monitors. But the angles were frugal with their secrets. He didn't see or hear Leonard again that night, though now his rounds were exercises in dread, each step a false herald to Leonard's idiotic and powerful laugh. Leonard followed him two nights later. Thomas had patrolled from the center of the mall to the carousel. The fat carousel, painted to resemble a circus tent, was as savage as the rest of the mall. The horses were tattooed, the brass torn off their saddles and hooves, their noses rubbed free of paint. The old scenes painted on the inner walls were hidden in tagger scrawl. Thomas thought he had heard something. A scrape against the metal of the two-story carousel, but paid it no attention. The carousel was old and abused, decaying a little each day until all that would be left were wooden carcasses flecked in paint. Thomas had made a ritual of his patrols. 
Since no one had said anything about his smoking, Thomas lit a cigarette at either end of the mall and enjoyed it on the way back to the surveillance room. That night, Thomas stopped inside of one of the entrances. The light pollution seeped into the hall like a limp tongue. Outside, his car sat alone in the parking lot and the river flowed on. He smoked his cigarette slowly, watching the glow of the moon surf on the river. When the cherry singed the filter, Thomas stubbed the cigarette out on his heel. As he did, a shape receded behind one of the rectangular pots behind him. From the little Thomas saw of the shape, it had the dimensions of a person. Thomas didn't look back, knowing it was Leonard. Any junky thief would have clubbed him to sleep already. Instead, Thomas continued his rounds and kept his strides even and calm. But if Leonard saw Thomas's face, he'd know, even in his condition, that Thomas was terrified. Now all Thomas heard between his steps were the soft pads of bare feet hurrying from shadow to shadow. Some creature that had been put into hiding, isolated from all the world. In rehab, Thomas learned that sometimes solitude helped ease a troubled mind. Yet in others, it further degraded them. Thomas tried to put a positive light on Leonard's curiosity. He thought perhaps Leonard was like a puppy sniffing behind the new visitor. The thought made breathing easier, until Thomas remembered that even if Leonard followed him out of curiosity, Leonard was still very much human, and as such, had a natural proclivity toward the deviant, like himself. Maybe, he thought, Leonard followed to see if Thomas touched a favored plaything or otherwise disobeyed some unspoken rule of the house. Before Thomas panicked, Leonard's state of mind might be toward the violent, toward ideas that would have Thomas pinned face first on the floor with an idiot's fist breaking his bones, and all the screaming would make Leonard pound harder and harder until Thomas needed to go to San Antonio or Houston for experimental surgeries for repair. His imagination threatened to drown him. It made Thomas's entire being endure the primal struggle between survival and reason. Every cell wanted to run at the grunts formed out of Leonard's mouth, wanted to jump at every treble-filled breath. He told himself to walk slowly, calmly, Leonard, by all accounts, was like a pet tiger. Like all captive animals grown accustomed to people, Leonard was calm but unpredictable and dangerous. Thomas reacted to the service hall door same as seeing God. Still, even when the door was closed behind him, Thomas didn't sprint for the surveillance room. If Leonard was a wild beast man, even the sound of retreat might trigger a rampage. So, Thomas made his way to the room slow and opened the door as if he were bored. Though he kept his ear trained for it, the service door never opened. Thomas locked the door and didn't leave until Reuben relieved him the next day. Leonard was bolder the next few nights. He never stood in plain sight but was louder and sloppier in his trailing. The full weight and strength of his limbs were present in the sounds of his observations. Throughout, Thomas kept his pace and his hand on the company nightstick, though he knew it would do him little good. Every scenario of Leonard's attack ended with Thomas's death, usually a horrible one. During one night, lighting a cigarette, Thomas caught a glimpse of Leonard in the reflection of a mirrored column. For the nights afterward, Thomas held his nightstick so tight he had to ice his hand at home. It wasn't his own morbid imagination now. He understood. He knew Leonard's dimensions. Mrs. Crawford said he was special, shy. Thomas had thought it was due to a stunted mental age, but the deformities hadn't stopped with Leonard's mind. They seeped into his limbs. After seeing him, Thomas understood why the cameras were at such odd angles. The bulbous skull and crooked maw. One arm raised, pressed to his chest as if injured, 
and the other was twisted but strong. All of his visible skin was patchy and gray, and Leonard moved like an ape, the large arm leading and the deformed leg slipping behind. But as crippled as Leonard seemed, Thomas knew the truth. Leonard was a threat. The man, isolated from society and its concepts of boundaries save the most primal, could do all types of things to Thomas against his will. Through it all, Leonard stayed away, never venturing close enough to touch or be seen, yet he was always there. At the end of one shift, Thomas asked Reuben about Leonard. Just don't look at him, Reuben said, shrugging. He won't do anything. And he's running around all night following me, Thomas went on. He's followed me. I used to have your job, Reuben said. Leonard is ugly but harmless. Just leave him alone. If he follows you, it's because he's curious. About what? He's like a dog, Reuben answered. He just wants to know who you are. In time, he'll get bored and leave you alone. Thomas nodded and went home to soak his cramped hand in ice water. Carlos had been right. After a week, Leonard didn't hound Thomas on this bi-hourly patrol. It seemed Leonard found him as boring as all the other security guards and went back to terrorizing the mall in his own harmless way. Leonard squirmed his way into the toy store one night and overturned the bin of teddy bears. Thomas heard his brutish laugh throughout his entire patrol. On another, Leonard managed to turn on one of the games in the Silver Coin Arcade. Thomas walked to the brief tunes of 32-bit glory cut short by sounds of loss and Leonard's frustration. But most nights, Leonard just played on the carousel. Thomas never saw it even in the surveillance room. The cameras only caught the light-edged rim of the carousel. But Thomas heard it. The cheap circus music scratching through worn-out speakers. The squeak of gears and Leonard's laughter. Full of sound and fury as his joy was, Thomas couldn't help but hear a twinge of innocence in it. Perhaps it was Leonard's glee that Thomas felt somehow matched his own when he had ridden that carousel as a boy. Or maybe it was how Reuben had explained it. Leonard was basically a puppy, not inherently good nor evil, just a creature of reactions. Prone to fits of overpowering emotion, there was a bestial quality of Leonard's intelligence, but no malice in it. More and more, Thomas pitied Leonard Crawford, the harmless but forever shunned. Ugly but kind, drawn to the meeting places of the public, but only when they were gone, leaving nothing but the ghosts of their sense. Thomas thought the world was cruel then. Leonard was a perfectly fine creature confined to the decaying Riverside Mall for nothing more than the comfort of the masses. If only they heard him laugh, Thomas thought. At first, as it was with him, the sound would be frightening. The sheer palpability of it was seldom heard in daylight. But if they could only listen, Thomas knew they'd feel its warmth and innocent joy. It was infectious. Not that he ever dared join in. In fact, Leonard hid whenever Thomas got within 50 yards of him. But Thomas listened and grew to admire it. Soon, his admiration turned to envy. Thomas used to laugh like that. Used to look at the world like it was built on magic and miracles. Life stole that from him, though Thomas couldn't remember exactly how. Ex-girlfriends took some of it with them a few by force. School took another along with a sizable chunk of his wages still. Work stole the rest, grinding away the days, gnawing until the week slid by with nothing to show for it but more bills and neck pain from a shitty mattress Thomas couldn't afford to replace. Thomas had tried to find that magic again with booze and smoke, but they had only left him twice as empty and twice as broke. But not Leonard. Leonard had learned enough of the world to hide from it, memories of scorn still fresh in his simple mind. Leonard's life was frolicking through the garbage of visitors like they were relics of his home world. 
Still, Leonard laughed with his entire being, all over a carousel he had ridden for years. In the surveillance room and on the way home, Thomas tried to recall a time he was ever happy enough to laugh like that. The fact that he couldn't stung him for days. Thomas got it into his head that seeing Leonard play on the carousel would somehow transfer some of that childish joy into him. Enamored with the idea as Thomas was, he still knew Leonard was dangerous. But all he needed was a glimpse, a quick look at Leonard's happy face. To do so, though, Thomas knew he'd have to be quiet. It took days of deliberation to convince himself to do it. A part of him said this was Leonard's private matter, but the thought was demolished by Thomas's selfishness. He, the world, needed the unbridled positivity hidden away at the Riverside Mall. All Thomas had to do was witness it and accept it like a virus. The world would be a better place if he took that look at Leonard in his moments of pure joy. For a week, Thomas only left the surveillance room when the cheap circus music came on. Even then, he walked only close enough to see the lights play across the storefronts. He got close, but never too close. On one night, though, it played like a siren song, and Thomas decided he'd finally look. Thomas removed his boots, feeling the gritty through his socks, and stepped a few times to test the silence. Next, he lit a cigarette and puffed at it until the cherry was bright and strong. Thomas left it burning on one of the potted plants. He thought that if Leonard was like an animal, the smoke smell might deceive Leonard enough for Thomas to get close. In the distance, the carousel echoed. Leonard's laugh was its offbeat percussion. As Thomas got closer, the carousel revealed itself by centimeters, mere glimpses of the colored bulbs at first, then the edges, and eventually the faces of horses. Defiled as they were, they kept a steady pace, the gears all greased and in working order. It took Thomas a moment to spot Leonard. Thomas thought he'd find him at the bottom, his disfigurement not allowing any seats beyond those. But Leonard was resourceful, and Thomas saw him on the second story in a two-seater shaped like a carriage, pulled by a thick-necked Clydesdale. Leonard raised his misshapen arm as though holding a set of invisible reins, snapping the imaginary leather to urge on his steed through some childish adventure playing in Leonard's head. All this brought forth that laugh Thomas wanted. Thomas stepped closer and stared at Leonard's face. His eyes were semi-closed and mouth gaped open like a wound. His joy revealed yellow, twisted teeth. Yet Thomas saw through the asymmetry of Leonard's features. He saw no skin color splashed over Leonard's cheeks. Paid no mind to the disproportioned skull. All he saw was joy, pure as the universe, refined. It was a thing no amount of money or drugs could replicate. The carousel's revolution hid Leonard from sight, and Thomas was filled with what he was convinced was the grace of charity. In flashes, he went over the next few months with Leonard, the gaining of trust and the start of their friendship, all because Leonard saw that Thomas wouldn't look away and didn't treat him cruelly. Thomas could teach Leonard to speak, he imagined, and Thomas would, after many discussions, reveal to Leonard that it was the simple joy he displayed on the carousel that inspired Thomas to be a better person. These dreams filled Thomas with a sleepy warmth, a sense he had found a path to be proud of, one that would lead him to the heights of human experience. When Leonard came around again, he stared at Thomas. It's okay, Thomas said, patting the air. I'm not here to hurt you. I want to be friends. Leonard was uncertain of what to do next, but after a few moments, he shuffled to the edge of the carousel and sniffed the air as if to test it. <laughs> Leonard revolved closer and Thomas got a clearer view of the extent of Leonard's deformities. The goiters and swellings, the patches of hair and scaly skin. 
It's okay, Thomas called, the carousel turning so Leonard was hidden again among the rods and wooden steeds. I just want to be friends. When Leonard returned, a distortion had overcome his frame, settling most startlingly in his eyes. There was no childlike innocence to them. Yellow and sickly, they had more tiger than lamb. Thomas stood in their predatory focus and knew another pure experience as old as life. Fear. The fear mice have of hawks. The fear of lost calves at the howls in the night. There was no humanity in Leonard's eyes. Only an aggression so complex that Leonard's mind couldn't articulate it in anything but the hunched pose of a wild animal ready to pounce. Like his laughter, Leonard's roar was hypnotic. Thomas didn't react to Leonard climbing down his carousel and jettisoning toward him like a wounded ape. Only when Leonard was a few feet away, teeth bared and voice quaking, did Thomas turn to run. But his sock slid on the tile and he landed on his knees. Like a sugar-coated infant, Thomas crawled away as fast as he could. Though nearly sprinting on all fours, Thomas knew it was useless. Leonard would tear him limb from limb. But the animal part of Thomas's brain strobed horrid scenarios at him, spurning him to be away, away, away. Something heavy landed on his back, flattening Thomas out and blasting the air from his lungs. His brain tried to summon all his strength and more. Only Thomas's arms responded, flailing fruitlessly, because his legs had ceased to work. A big grotesque paw clamped onto the back of Thomas's skull and pressed his forehead into the towel. Screaming, Thomas felt the cheap towel crunch under his forehead and felt Leonard's weight on his neck. Behind his eyes, a pressure built until Thomas couldn't shut them against their swelling and forceful evacuation. Blind, Thomas was consumed by the monstrous pressure. Yet through it all, Leonard laughed, hearty and strong, and the carousel played its scratchy song. And that was Leonard and the Carousel by Mario E. Martinez. A good reminder to hold on to your childish joy as long as you can. But after that, be careful where you go looking for it. Hanging around carousels is frowned upon, for example. A little about the author. Mario E. Martinez is a writer from South Texas, giggity. He's written two short story collections, San Casimiro, Texas, and A Pig Named Orinius, and other strange tales. He has a horror novel, Ash Tree, and is featured in the anthology series Roadkill, Texas Horror by Texas Writers, volumes 2, 5, and 6, among others. He's got a wild new book out called Neo Laredo, which I hope you'll pick up. Cora Camino and his friends just want to tag the infamous wall, the one King Gringo built along the border. But instead, they're kidnapped and forced to help a bunch of Americanos escape Neo Laredo. It's an easy job unless the murderous gangsters, vicious metameros, or team of psychic super soldiers get them first. You can find him on Facebook at The Mario E. Martinez or Mario E. Martinez, author. His Twitter is at Mario Martinez 39. His Instagram is at Mario E. Martinez Jr. And his website is www.MarioEMartinez.com. Gracias, Mario. And while you're at it, please remember to stop by our Apple Podcast page or wherever else you listen to your favorite podcasts and subscribe. The charts are based on subscriptions, not listens, by the way. So feel free to accidentally subscribe as many times as you want. I won't tell anyone, I promise. And if you feel like spreading the word and helping old Drew Blood out and convincing a friend or two to subscribe to my podcast, that would help me out greatly, and I'd really appreciate it. 
to hear a premium ad-free edition of tonight's and all our other podcast episodes, visit simplyscarypodcast.com today and click the patrons link in the upper menu. You'll find yourself at chillintellsfordarknights.com where you can become a patron for as little as $5 a month and get access to our entire audio archive dating back to 2012, including past episodes of this program and all our other shows, and hundreds of standalone releases, all of them ad-free and available to download or stream. If you happen to use Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, or YouTube, you can follow and subscribe to Chillin' Tales for Dark Nights there where you'll get all our latest updates and new releases and have the chance to interact with us each and every week. You'll find me personally on Facebook and Instagram and sometimes Twitter. Sometimes. And remember, we're accepting submissions. If you've got a story or two you'd like to be featured on this show, send it to drewbloodhorror at gmail.com. If selected, you'll get the full treatment. Well, I'm afraid this is where we part ways, at least till next week. So grab a drink for the road, friend, and make sure you stay on that road and off carousels, or you could wind up with your brain squashed out your ass. I'd like to take the time to say hello to some friends of the show whose brains have not yet been squashed out their ass. Scully's House of Thrillers, Gloria Lewis, and Jamie Shetler. Thanks for all the kind comments on YouTube. They really mean a lot to me. So without further ado, Scully's House of Thrillers, Gloria Lewis and Jamie Shetler. May the wind be at your back and may the road rise up to meet you. Remember the big news I hinted at last week? Well, maybe next week. Until then, happy Veterans Day and go fuck yourselves. <laughs> Good night, y'all. Chilling Tales for Dark Nights.